so this is Fred Schock, and he volunteered to do a presentation on uh, doing woodwork when you don't really have enough room to do woodwork. Uh, and a very and so uh, you know utilizing whatever space you have, uh, a small space. And so uh, it should be interesting. I when I started out, I I was in an apartment and I had the same issue. I had a very small space and I couldn't make much noise and uh, I had to uh, deal with a uh, very small space and it was it was uh, uh, difficult because I wasn't very well organized. So I'm interested to see what Fred has to say about that. So Fred, take, it's yours, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Joel. Um, the title for the presentation was Condo or Apartment Workshop Build. Um, to better understand the location and layout of my mini shop, I'm going to take you on a walkthrough video I made yesterday. So I have to go to screen share and we'll see if it works. Can you all see um, the video? Yes, we can. Still? Yes, okay, we can. Okay, great. Um, so this um, is the hallway entrance to our condo. We also have a patio entrance. I might show that later. Uh, the double doors are to a co coat closet and also used for storing small tools and hardware. It is directly across from the shop and adjacent to the entrance door. Stored on top of the workbench, beneath engineered floorboards is a two by five foot sheet of plywood. I'll tell you more about that later. The distance between the workbench and the cabinet to the left is all of two feet. As we enter the utility room, to the right is a metal circuit breaker box, a plastic key box, and a metal security control box for the alarm system. The metal wire rack above holds a couple of jigs at the far end. And when we get to the hot water heater, we've covered all of eight feet from the door. On the floor are a few jigs. And in the corner opposite the hot water heater is our HVAC. As we come around to the other side on the floor, a couple of concrete forming tubes or scraps, obviously a bench top drill press. I'll giving, be giving a live demo later about the modifications I made to this convertible router table. And on top of the narrow cabinet are parts for my Karen project. And behind the door, the top for the project. So that's the quick tour of the current state of the mini shop as of yesterday. So now let's start a few min months, let's say, before the mini build. Uh, when Governor Hogan issued an order prohibiting large gatherings, and closing senior centers, it didn't take long to realize that we'd be confined to our home for a long time. However, it wasn't until the fall that I decided to build a mini workshop. I did repairs to the condo, some Zoom classes, some uh, web page work, and then 
I finally decided, well, I'm going to look at the utility room. Building the mini shop was my way of confronting the challenges of the past year. As the saying goes, extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. I had to do something to stay connected with woodworking. In order to let you know where I'm coming from, I want to show these photos, which represent the relative sizes of my former shop in Northern Baltimore County, the Dakota Senior Center Wood Shop in Towson, and my current condo wood shop in Timonium. Just the postage size compared with the other. Let's take a brief look inside. Even though the workshop in Northern Baltimore County had over a thousand square feet, most power tools and cabinets, even the workbench were on casters because I was constantly changing the shop configuration depending on the projects I was working on. For example, a canoe restoration on its carrier. How to make room for that. A large wall unit build. Yet another shop configuration. So workflow and space allocation were important considerations. That has carried over into the condo shop as well. On the second floor rear of the Dakota Senior Center, is a three room wood shop. There and back of the parallel rooms at the front. The top floor is the Baltimore, uh, sorry, yeah, Baltimore County Department of Aging. Everything else on the bottom two floors is the senior center. Um, inside the workshop, um, where I began working five years ago, um, we see high ceilings, lots of good lighting, um, and each individual room, there are three of them, uh, has its own HVAC. While smaller power tools and working surfaces are in this room, the middle room has large power tools a couple of workbenches and lots of natural lighting, especially in the morning coming from the east. Um, you can see two drill presses. Here's a router table, dust collection, filter, piping, a drum sander, with a disc sander. This is one of the two workbenches, an air filter, another air filter. And over here in the corner, one of the pieces I've made in the mini shop is a cabinet for router bits to replace this little shelf unit now holding a bunch of old bits. More on that also later. The third room is primarily for finishing and some additional workspace. Workflow at the Senior Center Wood Shop seems to be secondary to room purpose. Small power tools and most work areas in one room. Large power tools and two workbenches in the middle room and a finishing room. Well, when Bicota closed, I took home parts for a second mantle I have been working on. Some might remember the first from the show and tell before the shutdown. So for the second mantle, the question was, where can I assemble the parts and do the painting in the condo? The first option I thought of was our laundry room. But my wife, Joni, wasn't too keen on the idea of my nailing on top of the washer and dryer. 
The other possibility was the utility room where I had a file cabinet in which I kept a few small power tools, two craftsman tool cabinets, a swivel chair, and a hand truck. There's also a cabinet for hardware, screws and bolts and nuts and so forth. After arranging the tool cabinets side by side and placing them on sturdy kitty litter boxes, I did the trim work and then painted the mantle in the laundry room. A nice compromise. After it was finished, oh, by the way, you can see the kitty litter boxes underneath. Um, I began thinking about the utility room to work on projects, but needed to make some changes. So I sold the tool cabinets, moved the file cabinet to a walk-in bedroom closet, and put the hand truck in our building's storage space. With the utility room cleared out, except for this swivel chair, I decided to keep that. I took stock of the remaining six by eight foot space. Door to utilities, eight feet, wall to wall, six feet. Next on the agenda was to look for a small workbench. A friend had purchased two from Harbor Freight. After visiting the store, I purchased one. The top measures 60 by 20 inches and is a good fit for the utility room. The wood is finger jointed throughout. The drawer bottoms, sides, and the bearing slide supports are MDF. The apron and the top are three quarter. The vice in terms of location and mechanics is less than let's say desirable, but the basics were there. So I set out to make some modifications. The first was to fill the space above the tray with drawers. Um, the tray is great for clutter, but not for much else. A four foot board runs lengthwise underneath the center for support of the midsection, which also has a cleat attached to the top. The two screws at the end uh, hold that support board in place. This was my construction plan. Very simply put together for measurements. The new end supports, also MDF, and full extension drawer slides, whereas the smaller upper two only open halfway. This is the plan for the center support extension. A few more details. This is the original. This is the extension. Cleats on either side of the bottom hold it in place. Trim on the front. Two metal plates, one on each side, on either side of the longitudinal board. The plates tie together the upper support to the new mid-support bottom. After construction, I had four six by 20 drawers that I can extend full length. I also added interlocking floorboards on top to enlarge the depth from 20 to 26 inches the depth of the surface area, of course. These boards can be removed to use bench storage for, or for any other purposes. As mentioned in the opening walkthrough, the five foot half sheet of bolted birch ply covers the full length of the workbench. 
And we'll see how I put that to use a little later. After cutting off eight inches for a project, I had stored, as mentioned before, the plywood underneath the surface floorboards. Storing sheet goods, et cetera, is a problem. We'll see some other solutions ahead. Because of the inferior quality of the workbench vise, I considered several options. The first was Steve Lattis workbench, but then I decided to make a Moxon vise. So that was my second project, the George the First. Because the workbench apron was just three quarters thick, I increased it to one and a half inches for better clamping support. Early on, I retrieved a metal shelf unit from our building storage area and placed it in the utility room where you previously saw the file cabinet. On top, I kept cut, cut pieces out of the way. This was the beginning of my third project. Not such a good location, even with the vent closed. The metal shells remained in place for over eight months. However, all along I knew there was too much wasted space. I eventually removed and replaced them with the narrow cabinet, which you saw in the video. Uh, that has adjustable shelves. I'll show you the cabinet up close and what these maple boards were used for later. For a bit, I wanted to focus on storage. I already mentioned the entranceway closet and the top of the original workbench. I also stored boards that seen behind the door for scraps, the concrete forming tubes. At that time passes, I needed more storage, especially for smaller pieces. Joni agreed to my using two wire racks in the utility room. Like many woodworkers, I'm a border hoarder, thinking I'll be able to use every scrap eventually or maybe someone else will. I also placed some pieces in our building's storage room from time to time. Right now, the other half of the Baltic birch plywood is standing there. And use just about every inch of available wall space, low, high, wherever. And as we'll soon see, even the breaker and security boxes. For small hand tools, a pegboard with hooks, a cardboard tube held up by the brackets to the wire shelf for my clamps and the small board for odds and ends. By the way, the orange Jorgensen easy hold clamps are excellent. I often join two together to more than double the length. I hang longer clamps on the wire shelf bracket. And of course, have a couple Jorgensen wood clamps on the end of the shelf and others on the board. This tiny shelf was a late addition. I needed something to keep small items off the workbench, but still readily accessible. The metal security and circuit breaker boxes are great for holding small items using rare earth magnets. Even the top of the key box is useful. Dowels inserted into the wall hold a level, a couple of um, Japanese saws, 
and a carpenter's square. As I mentioned before, I tried to use every surface other than work, the workbench as possible. In a fine woodworking article, article Mike Bilski writes that a working shop has three hearts. And I have to say, while my heart bleeds for a table saw and a planer, I had to settle initially for a borrowed Craftsman two horsepower router, which I soon returned because it was, as Joel mentioned about his, much too noisy in such a confined space. In a sense, three strikes and you're out. No table saw, no planer, and right now, at this point, no router. So what to do? Well, I took inventory for my file cabinet, now in the bedroom closet, I retrieved a random, a random orbital sander, an 18 gauge nailer, an impact driver, and a drill. Add to those a jigsaw, and that was pretty much my basic, um, let's say, power tool collection. At this point, I had to think more about what I needed for the projects I had in mind. The router cabinet was one of them. Now it was time to quote the Liberty Mutual commercial to only buy what you need, or maybe want would be a better or more accurate term. I replaced the Craftsman router with the Mikita compact router with plunge base. Uh, a friend in the Bicoda Center had one. I was particularly impressed by both its noise level and capabilities. Later on, I added an acrylic base plate and purchased the dust extracting nozzle. Before long, I purchased the bench top drill press. When this eight inch drill press took up space I needed on the workbench, I set it on a portable toolbox. Although it looks precarious, it was held in place with a steel weight and a toolbox handle, which extended over the drill press. So it was pretty steady. Months later, I purchased a small unfinished cabinet and added casters. The cabinet also provided storage for hand tools, two of which had been hanging on a pipe. I also used the drill press to support um, boards that I have to drill when the depth of the drill press is insufficient. So I use the hand drill. I learned that Stanley Black & Decker's marketing strategy was to advertise the DeWalt four and a half inch circular saw as tool only. After I then went and bought batteries, I discovered they didn't come with the charger. So it was back to Home Depot for the batteries. All in all, three purchases. I guess their marketing strategy is working given the fact that their stock has risen substantially during the pandemic. For low tech tools, I had chisels and a couple of planes. Although I enjoy sharpening, the setup takes a lot of the space. It didn't take long until the laundry room became the sharpening center. Having the utility sink and water nearby made a big difference. After storing the stones in the room, or I should say I'm restoring the stones in the room, reduced clutter in the mini shop. Joni and I just sharpened, scheduled our sharpening and laundry needs on different days of the week. 
My anchor miter gauge sat in the file cabinet until I purchased a convertible benchtop router table. At first, I stored the table on the end of the workbench. It can be attached to a wall, a space allowed, which it didn't in my case. My modifications, however, also made that impossible. More on that during the live demo. But before we leave this slide, I want to draw your attention to the step down caster. Four of them can support up to 800 pounds and enable the bench to be repositioned easily or even moved out of the room for utility maintenance. The Makita compact router and the router table became partners along with a sister lift. That's a four inch uh, square top with a four or five inch lift. No tabletop lift mechanism for this unit, that's for sure. Now that I had this set up, I had to deal with serious dust collection. A small stinger wet dry vac was just too noisy, especially in combination with the router. Fortunately, one of our neighbors, fortunately, none of our neighbors complained, but I decided and this might surprise you to use vacuum cleaner. I found it to be quiet, to have decent draw for the small area. It certainly takes up limited floor space and it empties easily. But I had a catch 22 situation. With the door closed to cut down on noise into the condo, the room quickly gets very warm and stuffy. The solution was to buy a long hose, which allows me to place the unit in the doorway to re redirect the exhaust. Repurposing tools was a necessary challenge. The home vacuum at dust collector is just one example. Another was the router table. Two additions were necessary before I could use the router for just some different purposes. First of all, the dust box. And additional hoses. The Centec coupler to the T. And as we'll see later, a cup that goes inside the dust box, which is connected directly to the router base. And we'll see that in the demo. The front is hinged and a knob secures it to the side. Now for demo purposes, I have a little catch on the side so I don't have to spend time opening, unscrewing this bolt and so forth. And very conveniently, it stores in the hole in the leg. When we go live, I'll show a couple of other features also. The bottom is also hinged for ease of access. Also notice the black block attached to the right underside as you look at it, with uh, two bolts and knobs. We'll see later how that is used. I also attached the rubber sleeve to the bottom of the router. It connects to a flexible air intake hose to keep sawdust and chips out of the motor when enclosed within the dust box. The flexible tube is held in place with a plastic dowel. And the clamps, of course, keep the hose out of the way. As 
Um, I keep mentioning I'll be doing a detailed overview of the modifications in a bit. When the router table was in the way on the workbench, I placed it on the cart and kept the drill press at the end of the table until I got that cabinet. Modifications to the router and its table have made a big difference. As such, it often becomes the tool of choice for such things as cutting profiles, rabbits, dovetails, dodos, slots, camfered edges, and for trimming the width of a board even. After many months of placing the router table on the storage box, I added a second unfinished cabinet. By adding shelves, I increased the storage space and the depth also helped. I saw this pic on the internet and could resist. Serious clutter is a definite no-no in a mini shop. When I decided to replace the metal shelves with a narrow cabinet, I purchased three quarter inch birch, birch plywood, as mentioned, and had the supplier cross cut it, um, actually rip cut it into four boards, each about 15 by 60. Due to lack of space, I scored, uh, uh, stored them in the car for a while. And I mentioned before, getting plywood into the condo was easy. I had my truck and we have a patio entrance. And then into an adjacent room before getting onto the workbench. I made this jig for the cabinet to cut stop dados there's the top and there's the stop dado in the side panels, all 60 inches onto the work surface. To cross cut the structural shelves, I use the circular saw and a simple jig. As in any shop, setup often takes more time than cutting. Before I mentioned repositioning the workbench, that enabled me to get behind and in front of the pegboard for clamping and gluing. However, I soon discovered that there was no way I could lift or tilt the unit off of the workbench. There just wasn't enough room. Uh, my wood supplier, told me a story about when he was a child, his father built a bed frame in his basement using dovetails connect to connect all the parts and then discovered that he couldn't get it up the steps into the house. It also reminds me of the airplane in the basement story. So after removing the clamps, I found the solution by positioning a portable folding table in the doorway. I then slid the cabinet onto it so my wife and I could ease both into the entrance area. And it was a good thing that the doorway is 36 inches in width. And with the cabinet on the table, I added locking casters and went upright, the movable shelves. This cabinet pretty much represents the major project size for the mini shop. As you saw in the opening video and in slides, 60 inches, that's the limit. This was the room configuration before I removed the metal shelves and added the unfinished cabinets. For ripping and cross cutting small pieces, I made this jig. The aluminum rails 
are covered with abrasion resistant tape. For repeated cuts, I use two clamps, one board as a fence to the other being cut. By adding an MDF board to this aluminum circular saw guide, I'm able to rip longer lengths. I prefer it to using the DeWalt small rip guide. You can see if you move this over to the edge, you still have more than two or three inches to the other side of the blade. I use this jig with micro adjustments on the router table for cleaning out large dovetails. The smaller blocks or spacers used to reduce screw length. I added locking knobs to remove screw wiggle. And by the way, um, here's a board added to the side block so that when I cut the dovetails, the dust, rather than flying in my face, hits this board. I cleaned up the dovetails for this cabinet using the jig up top and down at the bottom. And for smaller dovetail cleanup, um, I saw uh, this jig on Mike Petkovich's fine woodworking video and made a copy of it and used the small router in the plunge position with the acrylic base. This is the router cabinet it measures 36 by 25 by 12. Inside the four shelves hold 50 inserts. All take half inch or quarter inch shanks. Uh, they come from Rockler. Because I ran out of white paint, I painted the interior panels and the back light blue. I made this for the Vicoda wood shop, as mentioned before, and it's been sitting in the bedroom for months. This is my version of Mike Petkovich's hanging wall cabinet. When we go live, um, I doubt if I'll have time to show it. In fact, I would have to come back to slides because it's not together. I still have to, um, top coat the outside. Steve Lava's mini workbench is my next project. I mentioned that before. I'm modifying a length to 30 inches and I might have to modify the ways in which uh, I secure it to the workbench. Um, uh, somehow, I don't know where I'll store it. I'm sort of working out of options. As Scarlett O'Hara said, I think I'll bet that tomorrow, or tomorrow. For finishing in confined spaces, I had to go as fumeless as possible. I can't work on the patio, it's against um, rules and regulations. I've never known anyone who has a more sensitive nose than Joni. So for pieces I've made or refinished in the condo, I've used latex paint. However, one part at a time over many days to limit exposure. Mineral oil on the new workbench drawer fronts. For the smaller cabinet, shellac and Renaissance wax again, applied over several days 
to limit the smell of alcohol, let's say to a martini level. And I've left the unfinished cabinets, um, at least unfinished for now. So here's a 20 second recap as we do a slow fade. So in the beginning, I had this space to work with. And after clean out, I was ready for the slow build into the mini shop from August, let's say even up to yesterday. And there we have the latest iteration of the mini workshop. So if you have any questions before we go to the demo, I'd be happy to um, try to answer them. Uh, if you have a question, don't forget that you have to unmute. Long time yeah. ago, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Fred, this is Mark Whipple. That was an unbelievable, dude. <laughs> I am building- well, Thank you. I'm building a workshop in a garage, a two car garage. I just sold my car. So I got half of a garage and everything you just said, I'm trying to do right now. Um, Wonderful. <laughs> are you it makes hire? it all worthwhile. <laughs> Can I hire you to come to my house for a while? Cause man, I got to do so much stuff. But that workbench, the one that you just did, you said you got it at a Harbor Freight? Yes. Is that a kid, I guess? And then you just. Oh uh, yeah, it comes in a, a box, 60. Uh -huh. by five by about 18. Okay. Um, and then you modified it to your preferences like the under cabinet. Exactly. Yeah, and no, believe that... it or not, believe it or not, the original uh -huh. um, that my friend bought and he told me about sold for 119, but it's now up to around 139 or 149. That's a year uh -huh. later. And the other thing I want to do is all my equipment and tables, I want to put on casters. So where would you recommend I go to get those? I, I mean, does-, does Well, um, the, all that is listed in the bills of materials at the bottom of the agenda. Okay. And if you have any questions, just email me. I'd okay. be happy to- Yeah, well, to help. yeah, I definitely, I, I do, well, I'm the one that does the billiard table restoration and I, I have right. to- I just was working on some, you know, rails and they're pretty long. And that vice that you had that had the weird looking clamp, I don't know, it was a long one. And you gave it a uh -huh. name. Mo the moxin. The moxin? Yeah. Yeah. Where do I get that? <laughs> I need that. I made it. You made it. Okay, yeah. But yeah. Those, those special clamps, it doesn't matter what it is or well, I if you will. Well, I can look uh, at email me. I will send you that information. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, David Hickson okay. is also a good one for that. He made a bunch of them for the school he works at. Wow. I, yeah. Well, well I, I don't know if he, I don't know if he used the same hardware. Uh -huh. yeah. um, well, one thing I really was uh, excited was some of your great ideas on how to store the tools, the clamps. Um, I saw something with a steel rod. I've got I got like 20 steel rods, half inch thick threaded that I'm going to put on some racks and just, you know, hang stuff from. So now, one of the uh, challenges that I have, um, I'm the uh, person in charge of the Bakoda wood shop. Mm -hmm. And that happened one month before okay. the close down. Oh, wow. Um, and one of the things I want to do is go back and create sport storage space. Mm -hmm. with the cylinders, with all sorts of new possibilities. Um, so I will pass them on to you also. Is there stuff you're selling from that place? I mean... Yeah, we, we will be um, posting as soon as we are allowed to get people in. Okay. Um, Baltimore County has an eight-step phase-in program, which might take over two months. All I've right. already told Gene about the posting, but we can't, there's no sense posting it now uh, until people can come in and actually see the equipment. All right. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much.
Sure. Uh, uh, Fred, Fred, the vice that you had on that, do you still use that vice or do you use the vice at all or what do you do? So, um, do you do you just ignore it now that you have the moxin vice? No, um, that's why I'm making the ladder. And one of the modifications of the ladder, I'm going to try to make it so I can use the vice both at the end and on the side. Oh, okay, yeah, gotcha. Okay. So for the uh, for the current vice, I have to put a dowel and a board in, which is glued to the uh, the dowel is glued to the board, so that I can sort of twist the angle to hold a board in place. And the uh, very little little room behind the slanted wall, where the um, circuit breaker box is, for me to work. Right, gotcha. Okay, so that's a limitation. Hey, Fred. Did any... you, Fred, did you ever uh, think about using French cleats on the wall to to move stuff around and hang stuff on there? You know, I have uh, because the wall, be, as you'll see behind the router, is empty. Um. But I wanted to complete some of the projects before doing that. <laughs> that, that is definitely in mine. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. French cleats look like a uh, pretty versatile uh, um, organizing system. Oh, in, in fact, I, I built the um, the hanging wall cabinet for my granddaughter. Uh, she lives in an apartment, um, and. I sort of arranged the back so I can put a French cleat on it, but I'm not sure she can do that in her apartment. Oh, I got you. Got you. Right. Well, thank you. It was a fantastic shop. Thank you. Okay, there aren't any other questions. Uh, I'm going to attempt to switch the camera. Um, can you all see the router table? Yes, we can, Fred. Okay. Um, okay, I have to do a couple of things and I'll be right with you. Yes, we can, Fred, go ahead. Okay, fine. Um, so this is the uh, router table. Um, I don't want to assume that everyone has used or is familiar with the standard router table setup. So in a nutshell, there's the adjustable fence, and I'm going to say running in the x-axis, a miter track in front running parallel to the fence, two slots running in the y-axis, so the, the fence could be moved back and forth. And then we have the bit in the router and the table insert that holds the router, which you can see beneath. in here. Okay, this is my little clamp that will hold it in place. And this is the one that goes in here to hold it tight. One of the modifications I made um, is a T-track in the back. It's probably not too easy to see, uh, but the T-track holds this T-bolt in the back. And if I combine that with a miter bolt, either plastic or metal, I can then, after 
cutting additional holes in the aluminum support. I can insert the bolts and use the fence <laughs> in the Y axis. Wow. Okay. Uh, I, I talked about the the tracks. They came from a second, the plastic ones, um, Craig featherboard, which uh, can be used in either direction. So the question is why? Do I want the fence in the Y axis? Well, primarily for using the router table with the jigsaw. And I'll show that in a bit. Another modification is the addition of a second miter bar along the Y axis. These two are identical except for color. Now, what do I use that for? Oh, well, there it is. Here's the anchor jig, jig that I had in storage. And you might ask, well, if you already have a miter track, why do you want it in this direction? Well, look what happens. The weight is over the edge. Well, the first thought is, well, let's move it in. Huh? Then we encounter the router bit. However, when we change. Oops, you bumped your. You bumped your camera there, Fred. There you go. Oops. There you go. That better? Yep. yep. Uh, so we, if we change it in this direction, then you could say, well, don't you run into the fence? Well, fortunately, this particular fence extension comes off. And now I'm clear of the bit. And there's absolutely no wiggle whatsoever. Now I want to um, turn this around. Again, my space is limited. So I'll get the drill press out of the way. And the reason for turning it around is to show you the dust collecting system. Now you might remember a few months ago, Joel told us about the Centec couplers. I can't tell you, this has been a godsend. I can take my extension hose and put it into the coupler, which goes into the T, and the T splits into what I call the freelancer tube, which can be used for dust collection from the fence. It can be used just anywhere here. And I have one other option. I can close it. So the suction goes all into the box. Not exactly into the box, but we'll see that later. Um, the other option is to take a funnel And 
attach it, as I should try to mention before with this, onto the side. Now, one of the things in the shop that has really taught me is patience. You don't do anything quickly. Okay. Um, so what about the other tube in here? Well, to show that I'm going to turn the cabinet around again. Okay. So oh, if I want to take the router out, rather than going through all the motions of getting this and going in there and lifting it up, um, I discovered a tool that I had, but I had never before known what it was for. Of course, I should have read the back of it, which says CBS Hytron Tube Lifter. It's a vacuum tube lifter. One end is tapered, the other end has a claw. And I can very quickly, after removing the screws, lift this up and remove the router. Now I'm going to come up a little bit higher at this point because I want you to see inside, there's the hose. The hose does not collect dust that's floating around in the bin. The hose goes into a cup. Now you can see the bottom of the cup is against the back of the insert. This attaches to the plate through the screws with the cup in between. Now, where did I get that cup? Um, the cup looks like this. I removed the Velcro. I cut it down. I drilled holes to match the router plate. And then to keep it open, I used a pillbox cylinder internally, and that keeps it open. Of course, the tape holds that in place. But then there's another feature. I don't know if you noticed it, but I have part of a tin can wrapped around it. And the tin can, this shape of it, corresponds to the opening that's created between the router and the plate. If I don't close it up, the dust flies all the way around. So this is a um, tin can that's held on by the guide screw and then taped in place. And then um, with the router put on the insert, all I have to do, put the wire inside, put that together, and the motion of pushing it down and then putting the two screws in secures the, uh, the insert. You have to go get in the car. Pardon? 
I thought I heard someone ask or say something. Um, um, now, I have mentioned one other item that I wanted to show you. And that involves taking out the router. Tell you that there are a number of inserts that one can use. And for one of them, I took, well, I guess you can see it better this way, a saber saw, a jigsaw. And I modified the, the plate by putting a replacement made out of wood for this disc so that I could attach the jigsaw to the plate. However, when I did that, I found that I had to fill up this space. And there we have the level surface. And um, the jigsaw will go in. No way. I should say, just go in. Um, I'm going to fuss with it now. Um, and with it in position, there's the catch-22 situation. If I really want to use it, I have to take the box off. And the box clamps uh, on with the brackets. Um, because there's no way I can dust collect on this. But if you think about it, with the jigsaw in position and the fence in the Y axis, I can use it as a bandsaw. If I um, want to cut an angle rather than freehand, I can use a digital bevel gauge. Or if I want to set the fence to 90 degrees, I simply take an engineer's um, square and set the fence to 90 degrees, clamp it, and we're good to go. So that's the demo. I hope uh, if you have any questions, you'll uh, know that I'll be happy to answer all of them. So thanks so much for listening. Thank you. Where did you get the cup? Now, when you say the top, the yeah, cup, the cup, the, cup. The, the maroon colored cup that you put on the router. Okay, um, the router table and the inserts are all uh, from Rockler. Mm. Now, when I bought these, it was last Thanksgiving and they had a promotional sale. And for the promotional sale, you got the, the router table and the inserts. Now they're separate. I think they've learned from Stanley uh, how to market things. How much was it for that table? Um, it's in the materials list, not the price, oh, okay. but the link. Okay. Um, if you cut and paste it into the browser, uh, you can find out what it is. I don't remember what it was because, again, it was last Thanksgiving, and I don't want to guess. Uh, Fred, I, know, oh, I was going to say, um, I also know that um, Wood Talk, if, I think if you use Wood Talk as a promo code, promo code you'll get a discount because they've been promoting that this uh, last month ago. Um, they actually on their show was giving uh, one of these tables away. Uh, Rockler was, but uh, 
the they are the wood talk and rockler are teamed up together so they've got promo codes for all kinds of stuff through rockler so fred the the red wood wood cup that you mentioned is that in the list of materials also this no no the 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 thing to collect the dust from the router yes uh again if memory serves me correct uh, two hoses, the tea, and the cup. And it, I think it's Miles Craft, M I L E S C R A F T. That's right. You've got it listed there as well, Fred. Okay. So, Fred, most of these items were sourced either from Rockler or through Amazon or just generalized? I would say mostly from Amazon. Okay. I, I don't have the links underneath all of your entries. I know you provided them. While I'm managing the preparation of the minutes and waiting for the video, I'll go ahead and put all the links that you provided under each one of the line items. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions? I know there's a few of you who have unmuted. Go ahead and speak up. This is an amazing job. Well, thank you. Very good. I'm really embarrassed. I have a two car garage too, and there's no cars in it. So I actually have a two car garage and I can't, I don't have half the crap in my garage. You do. You have in your <laughs> cubicle there. Great, great ingenuity, Fred. How long did it take you to do all this? Well, I started in August. Um, and by the beginning of the year, I was making the, um, hmm. No, by the um, the first project was the, the uh, drawers, and that took a while. And I, I have to add one other thing. Um, my supplier is willing to mill boards for me and, um, you know, like the whole the board, board of birch cut it down to workable size. Um, I also have a, have a, have a friend uh, who lives uh, quite a distance away. And if I'm desperate for, a, especially a bandsaw, I go up to his place. So it, so your your supplier, is that the same one you've been, you've been doing work with for years up in Cockeysville? Yeah, um, Free State Timbers. Oh, it is Free State, okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's very, very helpful. Oh, very, very much. Uh, I've been going to Josh for over 20 years, 25 years, probably. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. Fred, well, uh, Fred a, uh, a phrase comes to mind to me is that the more limitations that you put on yourself, the more creativity that you have to have. <laughs> well, you, you know, you, you talk about limitations. Um, one of the things I used to do was put things any old place, like that clutter uh. slide I showed. And then I couldn't find things. So I wasted more time looking for tools. This way, if I take the clamp off, you know, and use it, I immediately put it back as soon as I'm finished. Uh, and everything's within reaching distance. Uh. Um, so there are advantages, uh, obviously, many disadvantages. I think the thing I, I'm not sure about, as far as a pro or a con, is dust collection. Okay. Having to do it so often, rather than just waiting for, like uh, my friend Hal Taylor, when he makes a rocking chair, there's, the workshop is just loaded with dust. And before he finishes, then he cleans it up. Uh -huh. I have to clean it up after practically everything I do. Otherwise, into the condo and, you know, we all know what dust is. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> yeah, I, f I found out when I, uh, when I built that hand, that wall-mounted hand tool storage cabinet that my ability to keep track of all my tools went up greatly because I could immediately see there, if there was an empty space up there and I would, I would immediately go look for it. 
you know, and, and most of the time I would, uh, I'm trying to discipline myself to once I use the tool, put it back immediately. Mm -hmm. So Fred, yeah, one of the things that um, I've got now in my house, my shop is really small, but it, it's, it's bigger, it's larger than yours. It might be like 12 by 14. It's in the basement. And um, one of the, like you, what I do is um, I clean up my dust every time I'm in the shop. And I, by the time I leave the shop, the uh, shop is clean. But if, if I'm in a situation where I'm creating a lots of dust, what I've done was, so I've got two windows in my basement where my shop is. And on one of those windows, what I've done was I've uh, um, uh, constructed a um, enclosure of Luan that I can remove and easily put in place. And I hang a 24 inch fan that goes out that window. So in addition to my air filter, I turn that fan on high that, that the window well comes off, the window comes off, you know, there's, there's that box and everything goes out that window. Well, um, when I had my shop out in the country, I built a, um, 24 inch airplane fan, yeah. believe it or not. Um, I saw it on the internet. It was someone up in Alaska that made fans for airplane shops and things like that. And I put that in and boy, what a difference that made. But here, there's absolutely no ventilation whatsoever within, you know, 30 feet. I mean, I completely appreciate that. I'm sure you were, you're probably masked up and your door is closed. Oh, you talk about masks up. Um, yeah. Handing in, you see right here. Sure. You know, it's interesting. One of the things I have found in um, using a, a vacuum in conjunction with my, um, my orbital sander, um, I, I have found that um, if I'm using that uh, tool a lot, there's still very, very fine dust that, that just gets everywhere. And so, so now what I do is I, I no longer do that down in my basement. I, even though I've, I have a filter and a vacuum and this other technique, I do it out in my driveway. I just hate yeah. the dust in the house like that. Yeah, years and years ago, I found that a, a little bit of dust makes me cough immediately. So I, that's not a negative, it's a positive because it immediately says to me, you know, wherever I am doing whatever, put a mask on. Uh-huh, yeah. So, uh, any other questions for Fred? I'd make one other comment, Fred. You should uh, you should get into designing uh, yacht interiors. You got to <laughs> you got to cram a lot into those. You got to cram a lot into a boat, and you've done a great job of it. Now, my my um, daughter and her husband actually live on a boat, um, and I always marvel at them. Built in Taiwan, out of teak, and of course. Um, I was recently asked if I will build them a, um, a dining table out of teak. And when I heard that it was 32 feet per board foot, I cringed. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that probably is not a recent price because I know lumber prices are just going through the, through the, the stratosphere uh, uh -huh. with that. So, yeah, that's probably not even a recent price. Well, actually, it was about a week ago. Yeah, that still could be. It could double by now. Okay. <laughs> the prices. You should have bought some then. Yeah. No, I, I, I've been listening to uh, uh, Shannon. Uh, what the heck's his last name? Uh, he has uh, um, the, uh, uh, gosh, what is it? The um, wood, wood industry updates. He's got his own podcast and he's been talking about how and why a lot of the lumber has gone up in prices. And it's, it's a matter of that the, uh, 
the distribution is the problem. There's there's lumber that's cut up at the sawmills. It's just a matter no of people. Yeah, there's no people to get it from the sawmills to the docks or to get it processed. Um, we're just we're we're we've got this lag from what's happening and it may it may take years for this to go. We've got another subject that we're talking about. So <laughs> so but anyway. <laughs> Then you get the ships stuck in the Suez Canal for three weeks. That's right. <laughs> yes. So um, any other questions for Fred? If not, we're going to close this thing down. And I appreciate Fred. This has been fantastic. Uh, very eye-opening, mostly inspiring. Um, and I know what some of the things I'm going to do this afternoon in my shop. Uh, so uh, is get rid of the clutter. <laughs> 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 it's the one thing. <laughs>